All right, salamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. I pray everyone is doing great. Let's go ahead and get started. Shh, shh, shh. Let's go ahead and get started. Bismillah. We begin in the name of Allah. Thank you all very much for accepting the invitation. Week in and week out, it's very nice to see on a Sunday afternoon a wonderful attendance here. Uh, so thank you all very much for sacrificing. I'm sure you have a lot to do on a Sunday, running errands and you know being with family and so forth, but you sacrificed that to be here today, and I appreciate that. So thank you so much to everyone, especially the young scholars in the house, the kids. So thank you all very much. Uh, we have a very, very, of course, important topic at hand and very um, uh, a beloved speaker to, I think, all of us, uh, particularly to myself, someone who's very near and dear to my heart who's going to be talking about an uh, important matter, why Palestine or Palestine matters to Muslims, right? Of course, from the lens of somebody that might be new to Islam, this might be something new to you, right, in terms of Palestine and what's happening and so forth. So what we've been trying to do for, uh, for since, of course, everything started, uh, is just to educate ourselves about this matter as well, so that we are equipped with knowledge, right? And that's very powerful. Uh, how many of you, by the way, um, I'm on a tangent here slightly, uh, went to the protest yesterday, uh, just by show of hands? A lot of people went out there yesterday. Alhamdulillah. All thanks to Allah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I know. I saw, saw some of the videos of the kids uh, with the flags, the Palestinian flags. May Allah reward you. But uh, of course, the topic at hand is, is what we just mentioned. We're going to go to about 2.30, and then we're going to break for questions, about five or ten minutes for questions. Please keep in mind 3.15 is prayer. So of course, we'll try to stop way before that. Uh, number two, in case you haven't as of yet, it uh, looks like the lunch is all gone, which is really good, and I appreciate that. But in case you want to grab some snacks, we just have snacks there, waters, drinks, coffee, and tea there in the back as well. So please don't feel shy. In our classes here, we have a welcome, of course, and we don't want anyone to feel shy. And number three, if you see someone sitting by themselves, just grab them. Like literally just, you know, arm lock and grab them, you know. We don't want anyone to sit by themselves. But again, thank you for accepting the invitation. Um, uh, Sheikh Tariq, of course, is no stranger to our community. He's been in the trenches with us for a number of years now helping us through this process. Sheikh Tariq is the religious director of OCIF. Help me out. This is the, the best part of it, I think. OCIF. What does this stand for? I heard all kinds of things. Excellent. Very good. Orange County Islamic Foundation. Did I even get that right? I got it right. Okay. I'm sure I'm right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. OCIF, Orange County Islamic Foundation, the beautiful mosque in Mission Viejo. So please make sure if you're in that uh, area, the South County, that you are visiting Sheikh Tariq and his wonderful community there as well. He's also part of the Shura Council of Southern California, an umbrella organization for many mosques and organization here in SoCal as well. So Sheikh Tariq, on a Sunday, you sacrifice from your family. Uh, Sheikh Tariq, of course, him and his wife were blessed to recently have a child as well. So, um, you know, may Allah reward you and bless you. As we said, the sleep does get better. <laughs> you will get some more rest, don't worry about it. But for you to sacrifice Sunday and, and your family to be here with us, to help us through this journey, man, for me personally, it, it means a lot. So thank you so much. May Allah bless you. May Allah reward you. May Allah keep you smiling. Let's see that smile, Sheikh. Inshallah. Allah bless you. Floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. We begin by praising God. And we ask God to send his peace and blessings upon the last final messenger. Assalamu alaikum to everyone. <clears throat> So why Palestine matters to Muslims seems like a pretty obvious answer. But what I want to do is view this from a different lens, right? Um, I understand, and me, you know, as someone who has been speaking about this literally everywhere for the past eight weeks, for the past you know, two months, um, it's tough to keep talking about it. And it's only so much information you can present before it becomes redundant. The last thing I want to do is bore you all with information you already know. So to, to make this a little bit different, I, I want to change the lens from which we view it. And to do this, I'm reminded of um, a moment where this terrorist, Netanyahu, he was doing a briefing, I don't know where, this is many years ago. And you have the map of the Middle East. And of course, you know, Israel is highlighted, it's blue, and the other parts, other countries are just another color. And you can't hear what's going on, but you can see what's going on. And Netanyahu points to the map, and he does this, and you can see an expression on his face. And you know what he's saying. It's like, all we have is this, and they have all this huge land. Why do they care so much about this? Why won't they just leave us alone? 
So the lens, we're going to look at it now, is the question of a non-Muslim. When they look at Muslims and say, why do you care so much about this? That's what we want to entertain. Right? So how do we go about doing this? And it starts by understanding the history. And we'll start from the moment of the Prophet ﷺ. Because the narrative given to the West is that this land belongs to the Jews. And historically, it's been the land of the Jews. So Muslims, it's like we're the invaders. It's like we're the ones who are foreign to this land. So what is the relationship of Muslims to this land? So we start with the verse of the Quran, Subhan al-ladhi asra bi'abdihi laylan min al-masdi al-haram ila al-masdi al-aqsa. Glory to the one who took the Prophet ﷺ from the Masjid al-Haram, the sacred mosque in Mecca, and in a night journey, sent him to Jerusalem. And what happened there in Jerusalem? Well, one of the things that happened was the Prophet ﷺ led the prayer of every, in front of every single prophet. The Prophet ﷺ led all the prophets in prayer. Now, when you look even at the average masjid, who leads prayer? Who is who's the primary person responsible for leading prayer? Who do you expect to be leading prayer? And it is the leader of the community, the imam. Now, I understand that imam is not there. Somebody else leads. Or sometimes there's a reciter of the Quran who has a beautiful voice. And so they give him precedence over, the, or the imam gives that person precedence. But normally speaking, the leader of the community is the one who leads prayer. So prayer is a ritual. It's a huge part of Islam. But at the same time, there are certain messages that come out in terms of the structure of prayer. That is, who really is the leader? So when the Prophet ﷺ led all the prophets in prayer, it tells us two things. Number one, all the prophets were tied to Jerusalem one way or another. The Prophet could have led them in Mecca. So why did Allah not just say, okay, in Mecca, every all of you gather and, and do your salah? No, it was in Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is the piece of land that every single Prophet either lived in or passed through. Every Prophet is tied to Jerusalem. It is called the Holy Land for a reason. And that is because the, it, is a, it is a ground zero for the message of Allah. And that is the message of La ilaha illallah. None is worthy of worship except Allah. And keep this in mind because this is a major point going forward. So that's one. Number two, that the Prophet is to be followed by all people. By all people. Moses, peace be upon him, had a role. And he played that role. Jesus had a role. And he played that role. But the Prophet ﷺ not only had a role and played it, his role is continued till the end of time. He is the only messenger that was sent to all of mankind. Moses was sent to a people. Jesus was sent to a people. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sent to all of humanity. And so, hypothetically speaking, if Musa السلام, was walking this earth today, Musa would follow who? The Prophet ﷺ. And when Jesus returns, as we Muslims believe, he will be following who? The Prophet, peace be upon him. So this sends a message to the Jews and the Christians that they are to follow the Prophet because their Prophet, so to speak, Moses or Jesus, had he been alive today, would be following the Prophet ﷺ. So here you have the connection between Muslims and Jerusalem. No, no. This land is more than just a piece of land that historically the Arabs aren't tied to. Rather, this is a land that is ground zero for a theology. And therefore, the people who carry that theology are the ones who belong to that land right there. And again, this is a major point as I'll unpack a little bit more going forward. 
Now, during the time of the second caliph, Umar ibn Khattab, عن, this is when the Muslim armies were expanding north, east, and west. And they open Jerusalem. They defeat the Roman army. And the general of that army was a companion by the name of Abu Ubaidah. <clears throat> and when Abu Ubaidah met with the Christian priests who were the custodians of Jerusalem, and the holders and possessors of the gate, the keys to the gates of Jerusalem. The feat has come. They, they accepted that. They were ready to hand to transfer the power to the Muslims. But when they saw Abu Ubaidah, the companion, they, re, they refused to give him the keys. Why? They said that in our books, it is described to us who the individual we are to give the keys of Jerusalem to. You're not that person. Let me repeat this. They said, the priests told the Muslims, in our book, it tells us who we will be giving the keys of Jerusalem to. You don't match that description. So call your caliph. So Abu Abaydah sent a letter to Umar. Goes down, Umar comes up. And as Umar was approaching the, uh, the, the jurisdiction of Jerusalem, he had his servant with him, and it is the advice of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that if you're traveling, if you are two people traveling with one mount, with one horse, then you have to be fair in how much time each person spends. So one third of the time is for person A, the second third of the time is person B, the third, the third portion of the time is for the mount to rest. Nobody's on it. And it just so happens that as they were approaching Jerusalem, it was his servant's turn to be on the mount. And Omar's clothing after travel is worn out. It's dirty and it was patched up. Omar ibn Khattab, out of fear of returning to Allah, having taken money from the Muslim you know, treasury, uh, with, with taking too much money from the treasury, he was afraid to be accountable for that standing in front of Allah. He would sew, he would tailor, his torn up garment, so he doesn't buy anything. Right. And so here you have the Khalifa, the Caliph of the Muslims, who just brought down the Roman army, the superpower, in torn clothes, worn out clothes, walking while his servant is on the mount. His servant said, you know, oh Khalifa, I mean, we're about to meet these people. So come on the mount and let me walk. That's more suitable for this arrangement for this meeting and Omar got upset he said if only somebody else said it remember we Arabs were such an irrelevant people we were so irrelevant to the world that people looked down upon us then Islam came and gave us dignity and anytime we go away from Islam we lose our dignity so he enters into Jerusalem, and here you have the archbishops and the priests and the prestigious people watching as the caliph is holding the reins of the mount while his servant is riding it. Do you know what happened then? They said that's the description that was given to us. That was the description given to us that the caliph is actually walking while his servant's on the mount in torn clothes. And so they gladly gave him the keys. So as he's walking around Jerusalem, he noticed something very quickly. There are no Jews. He asked, why aren't there any Jews? And the Christians said, we banned them. Because, well, they killed our God. So one of the first orders Omar came after receiving political authority of Jerusalem was to send letters to the Jewish families to bring them back. And from there, Muslims had been in power of Jerusalem. Fast forward a few centuries, the Crusaders come in. And you have a century of death and destruction in Jerusalem. And then Salah al-Din, the very renowned general, comes in, kicks the Crusaders out. He kicks them out peacefully. He makes an agreement, and we see this in the Kingdom of Heaven, if you saw that movie. Right? He get, tells them, look, I promise you, if you give up now, everybody can leave peacefully. I will send my guards to make sure you arrive to Rome, or at least to a certain point, peacefully. We will not kill you. 
And then that general, the, the leader of the crusader said, we slaughtered your people. And Salah Din, in his famous statement in the movie, what did he say? I'm not those people. I'm Salah Din. Right? And the crusaders left. And remember, history repeats itself. And there's a reason why I'm saying this is how Salah Din did it. This is how Amr al-Khattab did it. Because when the Muslims liberate Palestine, that's exactly how we'll do it. We have a track record. And now you have what's going on today. So why do we care about this? We tell the non-Muslim as they wonder. Because we see Jerusalem as a place of theology. And clearly, our theology is the theology which all the prophets were sent to, were sent, were sent with. And as you can see in our history, Christians and Jews and Muslims have lived in Jerusalem peacefully as neighbors. In fact, you can see on YouTube clips of very elderly Jews who precede the establishment of the state of Israel, calling themselves, I'm a Palestinian Jew, saying we used to babysit each other's kids. Right? So when we look at Palestine, it means something to us because it means something to the prophets. We are the followers of the prophets. And this doesn't mean we have exclusive right over Jerusalem. Rather, we 100% wholeheartedly accept the fact that Christians find this a holy land and Jews find it a holy land. And our prophet made sure that we understand non-Muslims living under Muslim political authority are protected. And our history shows us that they have been protected. And therefore, those who come and start saying we were oppressed under Muslims and all these Jews had to flee, flee the Muslim lands and, and whatnot. No, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's really look at what's really going on. Let's look at whether that's actually true or not. So this is why it matters to us. Now, when we address the issue in terms of what's going on today, and we ask the question, who does Jerusalem, Palestine belong to? We have this repeated phrase, God promised us this land. Who says this? The Zionists, right? The Zionists say this. And even more importantly, who keeps repeating this? The evangelicals. That's the bigger problem. That's the bigger problem. Because in their mind, in order for Jesus to come back, what needs to happen? They have to build a third temple. I understand Christianity is different sects and they have different beliefs, right? That's why I said the evangelicals. And so in these mega churches, you have these pastors and these priests saying, in order for Jesus to come back, the third temple must be established. And it comes to my mind, I mean, do you understand what you are saying? In order for Jesus to, in order for your sins to be forgiven, as you tell us, Jesus' blood needs to have been spilt. And in order for your Savior to come back, blood needs to be spilt. Do you understand what you're saying? Is this really God to you? This sounds like paganism to me. They're all about the blood. What's the deal with you? So did God promise this land to the Jews? And we look at the Quran. Now I'm talking to Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the fifth chapter, Enter the holy land, which God has, has ordained for you. Right? There's a difference between promise and ordained. But the question is, we Muslims, we don't play around with God. God isn't a tool to us. We fear God. And so I ask you all, I mean the non-Muslims, a question. Those who are preaching this. Under what premise did God promise them this? Why did God promise them this? What? what? Just because? He promised them that land. Why? Because they were believers. Because they were believers. And just because God promised you something does not guarantee that that promise will persist. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, God promises the righteous from among you 
and those who do good deeds, that you will be firm in this land. You will find stability on this earth, meaning you will be independent. You won't be oppressed, persecuted. Well, we know our history. It's gone up and down. Does, is, has God betrayed the promise? The answer is no. But he has conditions there. If you are righteous and you do good deeds, then you will find my promise. But if you betray that, then what? You will not get that promise. So that promise is conditional. Conditional to the fact that you are believers. But when the prophet, peace be upon him, came and they rejected him, what happened to their belief? They forfeited it. They have rejected the faith. They have disbelieved in Moses as they have disbelieved in Muhammad. May peace be upon them both. So God doesn't play games. And this really makes me mad. I don't know if anyone was at Irvine Khutbah uh, this Friday. People said I was really angry. Because I am. <laughs> right? Although that wasn't my intention. It just, it's utter nonsense the way they view God. So we believe that this promise that God gave the children of Israel was based on the fact that they were believers. And so when they disbelieved, they lost that merit. But when it comes to how we as Muslims are to manage that land, well, I mentioned just now, we wholeheartedly and sincerely accept the fact that Christians and Jews see this as a holy sight for them. And our history, which we are proud of, which spans 1,400 years, has seen Christians and Jews live in that land peacefully with their Muslim neighbors. In fact, there are many Palestinian Christians, aren't there? And how are they treated by the Zionist states? Not by Jews, by the Zionist states. The same as Muslims. Do you know that these radicals, not all Jews, right? These radicals spit on Christians as they walk by. This, these are people God's promise, you know, these are the people God promises good for, right? Clearly, you are delusional. And again, I'm talking about when I speak here, I'm talking about the Israeli, the current Israeli government, which is chaired by radicals and extremists who have used Zionism to hijack Judaism, right? And do their crimes. It's a colonial project. It's not a Jewish product, project, as we clearly see. So who does Jerusalem belong to? It belongs to humanity. It really does belong to humanity. We have holy, a holy site there. Christians have a holy site there. And Jews have a holy site there. It is the Islamic religious obligation of Muslims to protect their holy sites. You know, in Gaza... Israel bombed the third oldest church on earth. My question to, or my question to you know, non-Muslims, had if it is true that we Muslims are so fanatical and we want to eradicate the Jews and we're only, you know, we're supremacists, why is that church still there? Why is it still there? Why do Muslims and Palestinian Muslims and Christians lock hands with each other? You know, my mother and father born and raised in Palestine. My mother told me in school, we did not know the difference. We, cannot, we didn't know somebody was Christian until they actually said so. In fact, when I was in high school out in Chicago, we had the Arab group. There's a lot of Arabs there. And the Arab Muslims and the Arab Christians were friends. And the difference in religion did mean nothing to us, aside from theology, right, obviously. But in terms of friendship, seeing, uh, having each other's backs, protecting each other, hanging out with each other, you could not tell the difference. That is the mindset of the believers. Clearly, that's not the mindset of uh, the current Israeli government. The next thing we always hear, Israel's God's chosen people. They keep saying this. We're the chosen people. We're the chosen people. And that's just a ploy. It's a cover for impunity. And this isn't me saying this. This is Gideon Levy, a major Israeli journalist for the well-known uh, for the well-known um, journalist company, whatever the terminology is, uh, uh, Heretz. Very well known. He himself said he was asked a question: Why don't the Israelis, the citizens there, 
who I have no problem accepting. And I am confident that the average Jew or Israeli in Israel does not approve what's going on. Right? So somebody asked him, why don't Jews do more? And one of the re responses he said is that they don't know what's really going on. They don't know their history. And they were fed this propaganda that we are the chosen people, which essentially means whatever you do is okay. Right? And so is there a concept of chosen people that go to the Quran and say, look, God says we are the chosen people. We preferred you over humanity. Okay, hold on. Let's just look at the word. Fadbal. What does fadbal mean? It means to give more than what a person deserves. Meaning at that time, God gave them more than what he gave others. What did God give them? Religion. Prophets. What's that? Guidance. But as soon as they left that, what happened? Are they chosen anymore? I mean, honestly, do you Christians and those who propagate this propaganda, do you honestly believe God is sitting above his throne, looking down at humanity and saying, hmm, you know what? These people look cool. Let me go ahead and choose them. Honestly, is this how you see God? I mean, do you think God is of a certain race or ethnicity or gender or he has a skin color or he has a hair color that he prefers humans who look like him over others? Is that the God that you imagine in your mind? That's pure propaganda. That is pure tyranny and supremacist uh, mentality. So don't come to us and say we're God's chosen people. God has no chosen people at all. What about the prophets? The prophets were given a responsibility, and Allah makes it clear. He tells the prophet, not me, not you, not the average human being. He tells Rasulullah, the most beloved creation to him, if you worship other than me, I will nullify all your deeds and you will be a loser. God plays no games. Right? So there are no chosen people to God. There are no favorites with God. It's you and your actions. As Allah tells the Jews in the Quran, in ahsantum ahsantum li anfusikum. If you do good, you're doing good for yourself. You're the ones benefiting from that. Wa in asatum falaha. But if you do bad, you will get it. You will get the punishment. Right. Um, so we don't believe in this concept of chosen people. There are no chosen people. It's your actions. And anybody can be a righteous person. Anybody can be a wicked person. The Arab or the non-Arab, the, the black or the white, it doesn't matter to God. So there are no chosen people. So don't come to us with this propaganda. So when a non-Muslim comes to you and says, you know, these are God's chosen people and whoever curses Israel, then God curses them. We've heard this before, right? The Christians always say this. Well, when we look at the Quran, what does the Quran tell us? Again, in the fifth chapter, David and Jesus both cursed those who disbelieved from the children of Israel. So I'm not sure if that, that verse is actually there in the Bible. I, this isn't my field. But don't come at us with this propaganda. We see it for what it is. And so push back at it by bringing up this Clear point. I mean, do you think God actually prefers one over another? We're all God's creation, aren't we? So why would he prefer one over another? So presenting the issue to Americans and non-Muslims. Um, is this conflict an Islamic issue? Is it a religious issue? This is a very sensitive question, by the way. Is it a religious issue? Now, if they come and say, yes, this is a religious issue, it adds layers of complexity that makes it very difficult for us in the political American political realm. Because whenever religion is mixed with politics, it's automatically viewed as a type of radicalism. So what do we, how do we respond to this? Now for us as individuals, any good work, any helping of people is, it has a religious uh, motivation for us, right? Helping any human being. If there is a conflict going on on an island, 
that has nothing to do with Islam, and we can help those individuals, and that's a religious, you know, a religious behavior. But when it comes to the issue itself, we're not going to portray it as a religious issue. Why? Because this isn't just Muslims. Right? This isn't a battle of Muslims against Jews. That's how they want to make it seem so that Israel can continue to use their propaganda that the entire world is persecuting us and we're, we all, there's always an existential threat and everybody hates us and they're trying to eradicate us. No, no, that's not what's going on. Muslims don't have a problem with Jews. We never have. In fact, we know very well Historically speaking, it is undisputed that, that Jews were safer under Muslims than under Christians. There's no disputing that. So when, if a person comes and says, yes, this is a religious issue, then in the minds of people it becomes Muslims versus Jews. And that's not what's going on. What's going on is a people. In fact, now it's becoming humanity. The global population against a terrorist organization known as Netanyahu and his ilk. That's really what's going on. And so this issue is equally important to the Christian Arab, the Christian Palestinian, as it is to the Muslim Palestinian. It is equally concerning, it should be equally concerning to a Christian. And it's surprising to us Muslims. Do you not see your church as being destroyed? Does that not bother you, O oh Christians? When your people, people who believe in Jesus the way you believe is the truth, are spit at, by these radicals, that, that doesn't bother you. So it's not a religious issue in, in the political sense. Rather, it is a conflict between a people who are oppressed and a colonizer that is oppressing. That's how we portray it. Islamic, um, the Islamic narrative we, narr narrative we need to purport for the future of Palestine, because you're always hearing this. Anybody who watches Piers Morgan is, what's the solution to the problem? Right? What's the solution to the problem? How do you eradicate Hamas? This is exactly what keeps going on. But we need to have a narrative. And our narrative, by the way, I have heard conversations around this issue by many Muslims in many different contexts. And our narrative is united. We want peace for that land. We want peace for that area. We want to see a Jerusalem where a Muslim, a Christian, and a Jew can peacefully without blockades, without e extreme security checkpoints, without all of this chaos and this nonsense and carnage going on, to be able to access their holy sites without being in threat of violence. That's our vision for the future of Palestine. You can't tell us that that's not humane. And you cannot say that Israel's trying to do that. Their entire 75 years of being in that area has shown the exact opposite, the exact contrary, right? So that's a narrative we see, or we want to make sure that America and the West understands this is how we view the future of Palestine, a peaceful place for all people to equally access their holy sites and for all holy sites to be protected by whoever is in political authority in that land, right? But that means that the Jews need to leave. No, who said, who said that? Who said that? I promise you, I say this as a Palestinian. If there and there are Jews and Israelis who are moderate and considerate and human, had they been in power, you would find a lot of peace in that land. At this point, Palestinians could care less who's in power, whether Muslim or, or not. They just want to see peace. They want to be able to dream of a future. That's just human. It's no longer religious in the way these uh, fanatics want to portray it. Another thing we need to make sure is clear to America and the way we present this. Israel is not in the best interest of America. It's not. And what that means is when we try to make the cause for Palestine, we do it in a way that shows the average American that it is what's going on is harming America. In simple ways, like you have people who are homeless in America. You look at rural America, and it is crumbling. And you're sending all this aid to a fanatical regime that is harming the reputation of America at the global level. What kind of rationale is that? Right? So we tell the Americans... We need this money here in America. 
It's not that the money needs to go to Palestinians. There are other people who will take care of the Palestinians. We care about America. And we want that money to be here in America. And that APAC and this lobbying that they do is compromising your political leaders. They don't represent you. They represent the interests of APAC. Do you honestly accept a leader that has to go and kiss the hands, figuratively speaking, of this lobby? Is that the kind of president you want who is ruled by an interest group? No American wants this. If Americans knew this and they understand that they see this, they, it would infuriate them because it's very sensitive to the American mind. And also we need to expose the fact that the, is the Zionist lobbying and propaganda goes against freedom of speech. Show the Americans, show your family members, look at how they're trying to silence people. What happened to freedom of speech? This is very sensitive to Americans. So we make sure we show how Israeli propaganda and APAC and Zionism is trying to harm freedom of speech, how it is uh, ruling the political figures, right? How the political figures are under pressure. They cannot make decisions in the best interest of Americans and how this money sh is better off used for Americans. This is our narrative because us as Americans as Muslims living in America and as American Muslims, our number one priority, even from the religious lens, is to take care of the people around us. Before we go to other places, Israel is not in the best interest of America. It's harming America. And that's what we need to make sure that they understand. And then, you know, Pierce Morgan, do you condemn Hamas? What about Hamas? What about Hamas? If you call for a ceasefire, then you are pro-Hamas. Right? How do we deal with this? Now, there are some people who are more savvy in debate, who can be a little bit more aggressive. But I'm perfectly comfortable saying I could care less about Hamas. If this was a battle between the IDF and Hamas in some remote area where civilians aren't being killed, I wouldn't be speaking about this. Let whatever happens, happens. Hamas is an entity. They can take care of themselves. That's not my, they're not my responsibility. My responsibility is giving a voice to the oppressed people who don't have a voice. I could care less about the future of Hamas and what happens to Hamas. You have countries in the Arab world and the Middle East who will deal with Hamas. That's not my role as an American. And so I don't care to support them. And they're not my responsibility. Say whatever you want about Hamas. But do you condemn the killing? Islam is clear. The intentional targeting of civilians and non-combatants is, uh, is haram. It is impermissible. It is murder by ordain of, the, of Allah and his messenger. This isn't about Hamas and me protecting Hamas and me defending Hamas. A ceasefire isn't about Hamas. There are other ways of getting rid of Hamas if that needs to happen. Right? There are people who have leverage over Hamas. You need to under, like this is never brought up for whatever reason. And Israel has a history with Hamas. They're the ones who fund them and they do these things to play games. So they're at fault here. They say Hamas, it was an unprovoked attack. You created them. So deal with it. So what about Hamas? We, I don't, I could care less about Hamas. They're not my responsibility. And if you want me to con condemn Hamas, and they are truly guilty of the crimes that they are accused of, we condemn them. Well, we condemn Israel even more and a thousand times more. Because what Hamas did on October 7th isn't a drop in the bucket to what Israel has done. But the unprovoked attack, have you forgotten about 1948? Because they killed babies. There are pictures. It's Google. Deir Yassin, D-E-I-R space Y-A-S-I-N. And you will find images on Google of murdered babies. Who murdered them? All right. So what about Hamas? That's the answer. Do Muslims hate Jews? Clearly not. Clearly not. And we don't believe Jews hate Muslims. We have a relationship with Jews. We have long-standing relationships with Jews. People who are absolutely wonderful and humane who do not accept what's going on, and at times, Jews in America are more aggressive and doing more 
for Palestine than Muslims. We see this. So don't bring this Jews versus Muslim nonsense. It's not Jews versus Muslims, not Muslims versus Jews. Many Jews are on the side of the Palestine, the Palestinians. Many. Even in Israel. So it's not an issue of do Muslims hate Jews? We don't hate Jews. We have nothing against Jews. We've always lived with Jews. We have no problem with them. We're proud of our history being neighbors with Jews. And for the most part, there was tremendous peace. And if you ask Jewish scholars, when was the golden age of Judaism? They will say Andalusia, when it was run by Muslims. Right? So we're very proud of that. And finally, we distinguish between Zionism and Judaism. Our problem is with Zionism. And read the primary sources of Zionism. The founders of Zionism, they have books. These people were atheists. They weren't people of religion. They used Judaism for their own political gain. Zionism is a colonial project by admission in their own books. They literally say things like, well, the West is doing, Europe is doing, well, why don't we do it? Right? And we all sympathize with the plight and the history of Jews who have found much persecution and oppression throughout their history. And we are proud that the responsibility is on our shoulders to do what we can to protect them. We take pride in that. Not that they necessarily need it or that, you know, they're reaching, you know, they're beggars. Or, no, no, no. But we take pride in serving as a shield or as a friend for any human being. Our problem is with Zionism. And a lot of, unfortunately, people think Zionism and Judaism are one and the same. And so our role is that in America, we begin to educate the American masses. No, there is a difference. And we begin to educate the masses that Zionism is not in favor, is not in the best interest of Jews. In fact, they are harming Jews more than they are benefiting them. Now, in terms of actual action, I have uh, two minutes here. Real quickly, boycotts are very important. Starbucks has lost 10% of its company. And no, a lot of the problems in the world is due to the corporations, these multi-billion dollar corporations. They're one of the biggest problems. Not I'm talking about Palestine. I'm talking about globally. The corporations are soft colonial powers. And there's a lot of research in this regard and a lot of talk. It's not really the, the, the point today, but boycotts work. Continue to boycott. Encourage people to start buying from local shops, mom and pop shops, not from corporations, because these corporations are not only a national. What does that mean? America is just one segment of their consumer base. If America burns and crumbles, they could care less. That's one of the problems of corporations. And the second is that they are amoral. They have no morality. Their morality is just money. And they will see a people collapse. And they will cross all boundaries of etiquettes and ethics and morals for the purpose and the pursuit of profit. So there are people who run mom and pop shops, who do phenomenal work, who make phenomenal products, who make phenomenal food and coffee. That's who we need to support. And another thing, when we do that, now these lobbyists cannot have so much influence over, their, over our elected officials. But since the 80s, they see this. I mean, all the research, I'm not going to get into too much de detail because of time. Number two, political activism. We need to continue to organize. You know, um, the, the 40th district, with, which Mission, Mission Viejo is part of, there are five masajid in the 40th district of Young Kim. Five. And another four masajid within one mile of the district. How many Muslims are in this district? A ton. Which means we can flip seats. Because one of our concerns is Democrat, Republican, well, the APAC is funding both. So where do you go? And the answer is actually surprisingly simple. I couldn't figure this out until someone told me. She said, you find the new guy or the new lady, and you support them. And if we have the numbers, we could win. 
So beginning to organize. If you are a community organizer, you're interested in this, get with your masajid, understand who, what masajid are in your district, begin to connect those masajid together and rally. Also, a lot of these, um, there's a lot of pressure on political uh, elected officials, whether school boards or whatever, that the pressure is only coming from one side. And so they're, they're pressured into taking a stance and they'll tell Muslims, I'm on your side. But all the pressure is coming from there. It's like they're begging, put pressure on us so we don't have to take this stance. So we need to, to, we need to continue to be polit politically active and more organized. And finally, we need to change the narrative. Right now, Israel controls the narrative. That's changing very quickly. And we need to make sure that the narrative is clear. The future of Palestine needs to be a peaceful future. A future where Christians, Jews, and Muslims can coexist, live peacefully. That's not a, an insane dream. It's not. It's a real dream that has been the case for centuries. But the problem is this current government is not going to allow it to happen. That needs to change. We need to point their radicalism that Zionism is a radical ideology. It's not an issue of Judaism, okay? among other things that we discussed today. So I'll go ahead and stop there. I hope this has been of benefit to you all. Allah, Sheikh Tariq Ata, please give it up for Sheikh Tariq. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful, as, as usual, yeah, Sheikh. Thank yeah. you so much. May Allah reward you and bless you. So let's I mean. go ahead and open up for questions based on the topic. If anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand. And we have the brothers on the scoreboard here, and then I'll come over to the sister's side. Hi, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Miguel Morales. Um, so I do have a question to add on or to you personally, have you looked into the president of El Salvador's discussion on the Palestinian movement and the Hamas? Uh, I haven't, but I'm very, very humbled by the position of South America uh, in general. So um, right? just a quick uh, reference to him. He is Palestinian descent. Uh, hmm. Salvador holds the largest population of Palestinians in all of Latin America. So um, I didn't know that till recently. Neither did I. Um, but he is of descendant, I think third or fourth generation Palestinian descendant. And he has a very interesting view of it. And he states that the decline of the United States has been done intentionally by the Zionist movement to benefit Israel at the expense of the United States. I would urge you to look into that. Mm -hmm. And he's clearly stated Hamas is like MS-13. It must be eradicated in Palestine in order for Palestinians to prosper and move in the, in the, in the steps of peace. Mm -hmm. Do you agree or disagree with that? Again, I could care less about the future of Hamas. To me, whether they're there or not is irrelevant. But as one individual put it, you know, what Hamas's identity is very dependent on the fact that there's an enemy. If the enemy goes and there's no need for that. Now, uh, whatever happens to their future, I don't know what's, what it's going to be. But they're, they're, the Middle East is huge. And there are a lot of powers there. And of course, a state, what we want in the end is stability. And if Hamas turns out to be counterproductive to that stability, then naturally the Muslims will say, we don't need you. Right? Just like ISIS. I mean, it's nothing strange that Muslims fight against radicals. So if Hamas is truly a radical group that is a detriment to peace, then the Muslims themselves will, will deal with it, as we have dealt with ISIS and Al-Qaeda and other groups. Right? So to me, I could care less about the future of Hamas. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. And just to comment on what you said, uh, a lot of Palestinians did take refuge in South America. A third of our family is in Venezuela and Brazil. Oh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so um, what I was going to ask is, this discussion came up quite a few times in, in uh, halaqas and why did, what was the wisdom behind Omar ibn Khattab's decision to bring back the 80 or the Jews to Palestine in that time period? It could possibly be the fact that they were banned unjustly. So he was just simply enacting justice. Okay. Uh, it could be because um, 
he respected the fact that this is a holy site that they want to be to be in. So that can also be the case. Um, nothing that comes to mind. Yeah. Now you'll find people who like, especially in academia, they love doing this. There has to be some sort of diabolical, you know, intention behind it, right? He wanted to, you know, create more minorities so that he is able to, you know, hold more power because minorities tend to be more, um, more supportive of political entities. That's all nonsense. Omar al Khattab, he doesn't think that way as we know. So he probably just saw that they have a right to be there. And he's signaling to the Jews of the world that, you know, you're welcome to come here. Um, not that I know of. I could be ignorant, but not, as far as I'm aware, I, I'm not aware of any direct command like that. It is. It is. All right. Uh, questions? Anybody here on the sister's side? You have to put the sisters on the scoreboard. At least one question. Just <laughs> look at this. No, I don't. I don't think that whole project of building a canal is. is uh, it's like, it's an impossible, almost an impossible task, and so, the commentary about this, or the analysis that has resonated with me personally, and, and I mean, who am I in the end? But that this is, it's more of a business strategy. That when you look for investors, they want to see things that are innovative, things that are big, things that are interesting. So they every now and then they they bust out this, you know, map with the canal there and it just for political gain or just kind of lavishness um, or else I, I don't think that's really what's going on. I don't think that, that's what's going on. All right. Excellent. I'm just going to just shift gears. Uh, Sister Mariam, you have a question? We'll close it off with you, Sister Mariam. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Do you feel there's any reasonable justification for the Muslim leaders in the world not stepping in and helping Palestine? Or do you feel that their actions are inexcusable and they're going to be punished? My position is that the stance of the Arab world is spot on. They're not neutral, right? And as an Arab, um, their stance is surprisingly unified, right? When you have Sisi of Egypt pretty much uh, lecturing Blinken, that's unprecedented. Jordan, the same thing. Even the president of the Palestinian Authority, who I say this as a Palestinian, is one of the most corrupt people probably walking this earth. He's giving lectures and you know, refusing to meet with Biden and Blinken and, and whatnot. Um, it, it, to an Arab, wow, that's new. So what's going on? Now, I think what's going on is if you look before the conflict, um, and, and Arabs hate to hear this stuff, but let it be told. Um, the current crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Hamid bin Salman, he made a statement several years ago where he said, I'm going to turn the Middle East into the new Europe, right? But as the days go on, you see him going to Egypt, going here, going there, re-inviting Syria back to the Arab uh, Council, or whatever it's called, the Arab League, um, re-establishing relations with Iraq. And I'm sitting there looking, and it's before October 7th, like, wow, he's actually serious. He's actually serious about this, this vision. And lo and behold, October 7th happened, and you see that 
they're all speaking in unison. Their message is the same. So it seems like the Arabs, fortunately, united prior to October 7th. Um, and their stance is, is very clear uh, to make sure that this conflict doesn't spill over. The last thing that's needed is uh, World War III. And so them not interjecting militarily is the right choice because it's going to create chaos. Um, and number two, uh, working in ways that will delegitimize, or I should say weaken Israel. So one political analyst said uh, several weeks ago that he predicts that Jordan will declare the, their, their political agreement with Israel as void. Lo and behold, about two weeks ago, they started saying, we're, we're reconsidering our agreement with Israel. Egypt, the same thing. Why is that significant? Because when the ceasefire happens, which it wills, and now renegotiates and renegotiations need to happen, Israel's entering with nothing. America has completely weakened its stance. They're trying to push America out of the negotiation tables when it needs to happen. They're trying to bring in Russia and, and China. And that is in favor of Palestinians because Russia, China, the, Israel's not of interest to them. The Middle East is, as a whole, okay, the Middle East wants to see a better situation for Palestinians. Uh, so personally, you could agree, disagree, right? This is a, an endorsement of Saudi Arabia. It's not saying Mohammed bin Salman is the savior of the Ummah, right? That's, it's not. It just, this is politics. So I think their stance has been excellent, has been spot on, and we'll see what happens in the days to come. Again, I could be wrong. So again, we can have differing analysis of, of this, right? Israel's primary propaganda to legitimize their behaviors and their state is to claim that everybody hates us. We are always at some sort of existential threat. The world around us, they're conspiring against us. That, that's, the, that's how they legitimize themselves in front of the UN. So now you have all the surrounding states saying, hey, let's be friends. And now when they go up to the UN, everybody's you know, conspiring against us. And now the UN is looking, what do you mean? Everybody's friends around you. What are you talking about? It makes them look like psychopaths. Really. That's the way I've come to see it. Again, I could be wrong. This is political analysis, right? Um, so this isn't a religious thing. It's just my own my own take on it. Allahu Alam. So, uh, thank you so much, Sheikh Tariq. I'm just going to, just because of time, is a number of announcements I have to get to. I'm going to shift gears real quick. Sheikh Tariq, I had mentioned to you something earlier, mm -hmm. if you can help us out. Yeah. Um, again, this is a drastic shift. Please forgive me. I don't mean to, uh, the subject at hand is very important, but because of the time that we have, I want to make sure we get to something else as well really quickly. As you guys know, uh, the holiday season is upon us. Uh, for many of you that are new Muslims or uh, reverted to Islam, this period in the year is very difficult for a number of reasons uh, with family that might be from other religions, the pressure that you might get, the compromised situation that you might potentially be in. Of course, here at IIOC, it's very important for us weekly basis when we have these classes to take you through that under scholarship and imams and community leaders to help you through that journey. So, Sheikh Tariq, the question to you, uh, if it's okay, is navigating uh, the holiday time, specifically Christmas, as a convert, as a new Muslim. Any suggestions, advice that you can give? to our brothers and yeah. sisters that might be new to Islam or what you do during this time. Sure. So regarding religious holidays, right? So I'm specifically talking about holidays that are religious by its nature, by nature. It is not allowed for a Muslim to participate in religious holidays, right? Okay. What about I get an invitation to from my family, hey, come and join us for Christmas. Can I do that? The answer is yes. Okay, but right now I just said that you're not allowed to participate in religious holidays. The, how do we reconcile the two? Very simply, you go there with the intention of maintaining ties with your family and to represent Islam in a time where family gets together. So the reason you're going isn't to celebrate Christmas. The reason you're going is to be with family as an opportunity to show what it means to be a Muslim. Right? Now this doesn't mean you start opening the Quran and start debating. Maybe you have family members who like that kind of conversation. Go for it. But I'm guessing most people are gathered that day just to be with family and relax. So respect that climate. 
represent Islam in your actions. And actions are louder than, than words. All right? So what about exchanging of gifts? I can't go empty-handed. No problem. Take a gift. But your intention is you're just uh, fulfilling the etiquette of visiting somebody. Right? Can I accept gifts? Go ahead and accept it. What if there are crisp, Christmas symbols? Toss it out. What about like chocolate that's wrapped in Christmas colors? Enjoy it. Right? They're just colors in the end. Does, does that clarify kind of wholesomely? I appreciate okay. that, Sheikh Thank welcome. you so much. On that note, just want to uh, remind myself and everybody here, here at IOC, specifically within the New Muslim Program, uh, every year around this time, of course, the 24th or the 25th, uh, we do understand some of the pressure that our brothers and sisters might be facing, our New Muslim brothers and sisters. So we have an event here, of course, not to celebrate Christmas. I'm sure we're all on the same page, but it's an outlet, something permissible, so that you don't have to be in a situation where you're compromising your faith. Now again, as how Sheikh Tariq Atta said, if you're going with the intention to represent Islam, to be with your family, by all means. I don't want to take you away from that. But I know for other people, uh, it's, it's very challenging to even start that discussion. And we don't want you to sit at home depressed in anxiety with stress, etc. So that's why years ago, we, we, as we heard from you guys, so we have an event here and the turnout is amazing. So just keep, uh, just be patient with us. We're just trying to get all the logistics together. We'll get that information out. Most likely it's going to be on the 24th which is what uh, we've heard is uh, from the 25th and 24th, 24th being a time, particularly late afternoon, early evening, where we can get together. Again, the details are to come. Again, Sheikh Tari, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Please give it up for our dear Sheikh, Sheikh Tariq Atta. All right, I'm going to breeze through some of the announcements. Please be patient with me. The first thing is, uh, please don't forget about our diaper distribution this coming Friday. As you know, the third Friday of every month, we have a community diaper distribution. Muslim, non-Muslim, it doesn't matter. As you guys know, for those that are helping out, the majority of the people that are actually coming for the food distributions and the diaper distributions, part of our Dawah program, they're actually not Muslim. So the fact that our neighbors and people from other faiths are trusting us and coming here for a number of years now, it's amazing. So again, please get the word out. We'll get the flyer out there as well. Invite your neighbors, co-worker, anybody that you know that has kids or wipes and they need it for free, no problem. They just have to register. And of course, volunteers we always need as well. Uh, number two, uh, it was a blessing. Uh, I shouldn't make this announcement. Somebody else should be making it, but just for the sake of time. As you know, of part of our outreach program, we actually go out and we convey the message of Islam. It might be at malls. It might be at universities. It might be on street corners. Simple table, what you see in the lobby, free Qur'ans, and people come by, and we just have a wonderful discussion. Not a debate, but a fruitful discussion. A few days ago, it was amazing. I want to give a big shout-out. Uh, two brothers, uh, Brother Muhammad. Sorry not to put you on blast. Our dear Brother Muhammad. And uh, young Zaid, Zaid is not here today. Both of them, just with the little sciences, free Qur'ans and our da'wah table, uh, we, were, we were doing da'wah at Disneyland, not me. They were doing da'wah, outreach in front of Disneyland across the street. Public area, just passing our free information. As you can imagine, hundreds of people, right? Disneyland, traffic going in and out, cars. A car comes by, stops, two individuals come out. If you, haven't, if you saw the post, don't say anything, right? One was, and a big shout out to them, may Allah bless them, a professional uh, boxer, Muslim, uh, Hasim Rahman Jr. Anybody know Hasim Rahman Jr.? Yes. His father was Hasim Rahman. If those of you, you know Mike Tyson days, Lennox Lewis. He fought Lennox Lewis and he won the t His son, Hasim Rahman Jr., he hopped out. And another brother, forgive me, brother, if you're listening. Uh, you had like 4 million uh, followers. I'm so sorry, dude. But the name is M2 Tak or Tak, M2 T H A K. Uh, he has like three and a half million uh, followers. I don't know. I'm, I'm butchering his name. I don't know his first name. But both of them hopped out. Check this out. Hundreds of people. Both of them are Muslim, by the way. They come out and they encourage the brothers at the table. Two brothers standing at the table. Just a table. Actually, that was a tablecloth that Sheikh Tariq sitting on. And they encouraged them. Not only that, they were happy, man. Right? They were happy. And they also took some Qur'ans. Right? So I just personally never judge a book by its cover. Never. You never know uh, the heart of somebody, right? Not to say that, you know, but please, uh, one of the things we always try to stress here at IFC is the welcoming uh, theme that we have, the welcoming family and, and, and the commitment that we have. But those two brothers that stepped up, uh, I just want to give a big shout out to both of them, uh, both of them being Muslims and both of them just, 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 they're on their way to doing something else. They just hopped out and just said, thank you so much and encouraged the brothers at the table. So, so a big shout out to them as well. Um, 
Uh, really quickly as well, uh, donation box is here. If you can help us offset the expenses, we always leave it here. You can drop something here, some snacks here as well. I want to highlight uh, people that are here for the first time, as we do always week in and week out. Last Sunday, so one week from today, last Sunday, we were blessed. We actually had two people that became Muslim, two shahadas. Sister Mirna, she might be online, and Brother Albert. Brother Albert is actually here. Albert, if you can just kindly raise your hand. You can, you can, uh, mashallah, our dear brother. Uh, dear, welcome, our dear brother Albert. So this is Albert's first, second class, I think, right? Because you were actually attended the class as well. So uh, big shout out to them. And then this past Friday, meaning two days ago, we also had two other people here at ISU that became Muslim, Sister Paola and Sister Cassie. Paola was not able to make it, but Sister Cassie is here. Sister Cassie, if you can just kindly raise your hand. Can you imagine that, how beautiful that is? Just within like a few days, how many people, just here in this community, not nationwide, just in this community. Uh, I also want to uh, welcome our dear brother Julian. Yesterday, actually, he embraced Islam at another masjid in San Gabriel. Um, the brother who gave him the shahadas, our dear brother Qari Abdurrahman, who is the brother of Sister Sumaya and Sister Maymuna. He instantly contacted me. He said, brother, can you help our brother out? We said, yes, we got on the phone, and he's here today. Julian, can you just raise your hand for us, please? Really quickly, Julian says something as I was sitting next to him. I asked him if he doesn't mind sharing that. Julian, are you okay with sharing it? Uh, just 30 seconds. Is that okay? I just want you to hear this, please. So, um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Julian. Um, I, I took my shahada uh, just yesterday. Like, I really, it was a complete surprise to me. I mean, I just went to the mosque just to come pray. And, like, I wasn't really trying to become a Muslim. I just wanted to learn more about it. And then, like, I want to say within, like, like 30 minutes, like, um, uh, brother Abdul um, invited me to take my shahada and then like I took it in front of 10 people and um, now I'm a Muslim and I'm, I'm very happy. So um, it's nice to meet you all and uh, God bless everyone. Allah bless you. What number is that? Five. Alhamdulillah. Again, I'm not doing this for the numbers. I just want you to see the blessing that this community has and by extension many other communities. But it doesn't stop there. Alhamdulillah. The next announcement I would like to give, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to ask my dear brother Muhammad uh, if you can come up here, Muhammad, if you don't mind. Uh, Muhammad is going to make an announcement. Something's very near and dear to his heart, and I think my heart, and then by extension, everybody else. Muhammad, I'm going to ask you to go up there if you don't mind uh, with our dear Sheikh Tariq. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So um, this is a very special moment for me because uh, for some reason I love this guy. <laughs> I feel like he's my younger brother for real. Like I care for him uh, just like I care for my younger brother. And uh, we've been working together uh, at the hotel for a few months. And um, he, he um, after studying Islam and questioning Islam, he, he understand the need of him becoming a Muslim. He understands that he needs Allah in his life. And uh, Allahu Akbar, I'm, I'm Allahu very proud of him, Akbar. very happy for him. Um, Allahu so, um, Akbar, Allah. You'd like to take his shahada, you'd like to become Muslim. Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha Anybody pressuring Allah. you? Anybody forcing you? So, so really quick. Being uh, Catholic, I shadow Allah. لا لا إله إلا الله و أشهد أن أن محمدا رسول الله. I bear witness that there is no god worthy of worship but Allah. And I bear witness, I bear witness that, Prophet Muhammad, that Prophet Muhammad is his messenger, is his messenger and servant. Takbir.
Please come congratulate your brother or hold on. So not yet. As I was sitting there, Sheikh, please stay here. As I was sitting there, Brother Rafael approaches me. He says, I would like to take Shahada as well. Uh, Sheikh Tariq, I will ask you to please conduct the Shahada, please. I, I didn't stage this, by the way. I didn't say, okay, wait till he does it. Then he, no, no. This is from Allah. He just walked over to me. He said, I would like to become a Muslim too. So, Sheikh Tariq, if you can help us out. So, you can do the same exact thing, right? You're going to bear witness that you truly believe that God, Allah, is the only one worthy of worship, that you'll only worship Him, and that Muhammad is His last and final messenger. So, we'll say in Arabic first and then in English. You ready? So just repeat after me. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. An. An. La. La. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa. Illa. Allah. Allah. Wa. Wa. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Rasul. Rasul. Allah. Allah. I bear witness. I bear witness. That none is worthy of worship. That none is worthy of worship. Except Allah. Except Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness. That Muhammad. That Muhammad. Is his last and final messenger. Is his last and final messenger. Welcome to the family. Congratulations. Would anybody else? <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there as I try to do. If you are on the fence, honestly, if you're here and you've been looking into Islam, and if you're on the fence and you'd like to take your shahada and become a Muslim, just raise your hand, man. No pressure, though. You would? If you could, yeah, because you already, mashallah. That is, um, again, I'm not in the numbers thing, but I just want you to see the blessing of this community. That is seven people, six people, and Julian being the seventh, of course, since last, uh, I lost count, man, Friday, like in a week and two days or so, just in one community, brothers and sisters. All you have to do, just put in a little bit of effort. Allah will take care of it. You just got to do your part, man. If that means hold some Qurans with you, some brochures, whatever it is, uh, your akhlaq, your character, your manners, you know what I mean? Just do whatever you can within your capacity. Everybody you have, if you're on social media, you have it, whatever, whether it's editing videos, whatever it is, you're getting the reward, man. Allah will take care of it, inshallah. Of course, by Allah is, he's in control. He's in control. All we have to do is just put in the effort as best as we can. So again, uh, brothers, sorry, sisters, brothers, make sure to welcome our brothers. Inshallah, you can, of course, do so as well. Uh, brother Emmanuel and our, our dear brother Rafael, both of them new to Islam, inshallah. Of course, I do need to ask everyone to kindly help me with the tables and chairs as well. If you guys don't mind, if we can put them on the racks. We pray 3.15. You got 15 minutes. Again, may Allah reward you. May Allah bless you. Sheikh Tariq, as usual, you're bringing the barakah, the blessing, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you all very much. We'll see you guys Friday. Coffee with the Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.